our fear of how we are perceived. I think that sometimes people won't put themselves out there in a goal or a challenge or something they're doing for the fear of how to look. As you become more self-aware, you begin to actually look at your life. You begin to look at patterns. You begin to find things at one point you were really passionate about. When you start to look at your life, you know, it's that the quote I always say from Parker J. Palmer, your life is speaking to you. You know, it's just when you actually listen to it. Welcome back to another episode of the New Rules Podcast. It's your girl, Breezy. <laughs> and that little chuckle <laughs> on, the, on the mic is your wonderful host, Adrian Crawford. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Good, 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 good. So we're recording, getting close to Christmas time, you know. Yeah. So Bri, are you a Christmas music person? You know, like, you know, like, do you like listening to Christmas music? You know, are you playing it like in your room and, you know, or stuff like that in the house? I made you... that face because at first when you said that, I'm like, w- when I hear Christmas music, all yep. I think of is Mariah Carey. Like, yeah, that's yeah. the only Christmas music, Christmas music that really exists. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think I am. I, I like Christmas decor. Mm-hmm. I like certain christmas movies Mm -hmm. i i just like the feeling in the air i don't i don't think i play the music a Mm -hmm. ton but i but i like the general like the cold the christmas spirit yeah yeah are you no i mean i'm like i'm not opposed to it it's like if it's on i can't see you like driving no definitely not (laughs) definitely not definitely not it's like in the house jingle yeah (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, your boy's not on the jingle bell rock you know (laughs) I bet you're going to get, you know, um, a little old school hip hop, a little run DMC, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, you know, it's Christmas time, you know, mm-hmm. in Hollis, Queens, mom's cooking chicken and collard greens. You know? oh <laughs> <laughs> That's about as bad you can get. But no, um, I will, um, I, if it's playing, you know, during Christmas, like we have dinner or, um, you know, or just people at the house or whatever during that time. And we just kind of put it on like, yeah, mm-hmm. you're fine with that or yeah, whatever. But vibes. yeah, but no, I'm not a big Christmas music person. I am a, I like like movies. So I would mm-hmm. ask you that question. What is your favorite uh, Christmas movie? My favorite Christmas movie is, I don't know if this one counts, but I, I would know, say, it's, say it. Harry Potter, but the one where the, the <laughs> where the table is clear it's like christmas season <laughs> yo that's a yo let me tell you this of all the times i've talked to people about christmas movie i have never like when you <laughs> said that i was like oh maybe she'll say like love actually because you know there's i think if i'm not mistaken in love actually there's a little christmas part during love actually or, or anything i was like she's gonna say something i know you enough to know you're gonna say something that's not like normal but <laughs> dog harry potter that's no, but you wild. know how in harry potter they change the set the the table settings and they always show what season it is whenever you're coming in yeah, yeah, yeah. and i don't know which one it is but there's one where it's just so obviously christmas okay that you just watch it and you're like, I just, wish I was there. Let me tell you this. Like, I normally am never like a, man, it's not a Christmas movie guy, right? But I'm telling you, it's not a Christmas movie okay, guy Okay, well, right my now. other one is The Polar Express. Okay. And it's okay. The Polar Express because whenever I was in fifth grade, I was in The Polar Express play, the wow. musical at my school. Mm. So what, I know every song. Oh, gosh. What did you, what was, uh, what was your character? Unfortunately... I, I I didn't show up to the um, yo on brand. I didn't go to the, I didn't go to the uh, what's it called the actual, run throughs. I don't yeah. know. I've called what we call it now. Yeah, use it. Um, and so I I got um demoted as wow. the the person on the side bleachers doing the like hand motions while wow. you're singing the songs. Dang, you got the fill in. I like to make my parents proud. There we go. <laughs> no, um, I would say for me, favorite Christmas movie are gonna be um very debated on christmas movies so i'm gonna go home alone okay. home alone is definitely in there for me um die hard is definitely in there for me shout out die hard my man you know and that's one of the ones that people debate about yeah they'll debate about die hard and i think the other one elf elf is just elite i've yeah. never watched it all the way oh my gosh what Sarah! 
what? <laughs> everyone in the room like shocked what yeah i I, I'm not like I guess I am not really a Christmas movie person. No. I, I haven't really seen that many. Oh my gosh, Brie! All right, well, like I associate Christmas with like rom coms. Yeah, I mean I could see that. Which I so. don't appreciate, but yeah, but wow, never seen that. Okay, well we'll have to like remedy that. <laughs> yeah, we'll hopefully have to watch so. It. Yeah, we have to do that. All right, what we got today, Brie? Well, Brie, well, Brie, let the people know if they're coming into the pod what the pod's all about. <laughs> no, it's all about unlocking authenticity and developing the authentic leader because we believe that that leads to human flourishing. Mm-hmm. If this podcast has added any value to you. Sus- subscribe yeah. subscribe to our youtube channel and give us a a connect on linkedin at adrian crawford for both the youtube channel and the linkedin profile you can find us at adrian crawford yep love it love it thank you all for uh, again uh, sharing liking all the stuff we appreciate that we keep continuing to hope and, and make sure you reach out we want to continue to add value so if there's things that you're like man i would love to you guys talk about this or this subject or questions make sure you reach out we would love to be able to try to help answer those and again we want to add as much value as possible possible so that being said today Bree, what we got going on the pod today today we are talking about new year new me mm, 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 mm. how does that hit you dumb <laughs> dumb dumb I, I new year new me dumb here's why because people just think it's just a, you know the you know the changing of the calendar year that all of a sudden you know you're gonna change. I'm like, nope. If you're an a hole in 2023, you're gonna be one going into 2024. <laughs> so Aww. like you know, Sorry, I, guys. I know. So yeah, you, you can stop the pod now. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> no, that's basically what this podcast is about. Well, yeah. I, I mean, no, and I, I I joke about that, but I really do think people have. I mean, we live in in a time, and, and it's always been this way, where we feel like it's these certain moments right and again i do believe in like there is something to a a energy around when the year changes that there's you know more uh you know it can be a reset i don't say that i mean i'm joking with that but i also am not joking on the other side because i think so many times people just think the change of the year is going to do but they change no habits they change no um circumstances situations they just think i'm just going to believe this manifest it you know you know, get their crystals out and, you know, whatever they do, and then it's going to all change, and usually it doesn't. And so I uh, so I think you have to be intentional. So, uh, again, that's what we want to talk about today. How do we actually <laughs> help people really have New Year, New Me? I don't like the – when I hear that mantra, it's always – it always comes from a place of where I think when people just – they're hoping for their best year now or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. and stuff. especially, you know, man, in the church world, that's – who you hear that a lot, right? Man, it's going to be my best year at, yet. And as my good friend Clayton says, what if God says, you know what, those years – gonna be average like you know what i'm saying <laughs> like this year is just gonna be you know what just gonna be steady how would that make you feel you know so anyway what we got today let's jump into it let's talk about it <laughs> well i think to start us off i mean you're you're kind of starting to touch on it but i think as a society we all collectively agree that none of us really ever end up fulfilling all of our new year's goals mm-hmm. but we still make them and we still yep. try to do them mm-hmm. where do you think that we go wrong um, I, I think that one, I, I think it's self-awareness. I think it's knowing who you are. I, I think we can, I think it's important to have like goals or things you're trying to get better at and that are measurable and you can actually move toward those things. I think the problem is some people may not be year long goal people. They may be better at short run. Here, here I have a three month goal one month goal, six month goal, you know, something like that. I think we just all get caught into, okay, here's my one year. And so here's what I'm going to do in that one year. Also, then I don't think sometimes they're measurable. And then other thing, I don't think people actually put in the, um, the kind of what are the practical daily things you're going to have to do in order to achieve that. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to lose 50 pounds. Okay. So what does that look like daily? What does that look like weekly? Um, how are you going to track that? How are you going to measure that? You know, man, I want to spend more time with my children. Well, how much time do you want to spend with them? What does that time look like? Why do you want to spend time with them? I think all those things are kind of, we just throw them out there because we're, we're supposed to, but we, I don't think we think critically about uh, how to actually accomplish those. Or, or do they actually fit to do one of your goals for yourself? Hmm. How do you think that we can start to create goals that are more grounded in reality? Um, I think starting off, like, I'm, I'm always going to get here, and it's, you know, if it's a broken record on this pod, but it's getting to the why. I think you get grounded in reality if you're asking yourself why. Like, why are you, why do you have these goals and aspirations, and um, and why are you wanting to see these changes? Um, why are you wanting to 
um, you know, change the way that you look? Why are you wanting to make this type of money? Um, why are you wanting to travel? Whatever, whatever those things are. Um, uh, I think that it's really important to ask that because I think those will be the drivers. I think those what make you what makes things last. I've learned for me personally when it's just kind of very like when I think shallow, it's just nothing that's like for long term focus, right? And for me, like really working on like you know this year going even to next year constantly keep working on my health well for a long time i said like, i just want to kind of look better i just want to look better i want to look better but now for me it's more of like man i want energy i want longevity i want to be around to make as much impact as i can so this is important for me to do this and so that's why i kind of have these like goals and aspirations of working on my health and things like that so i think the why is really important Something that you mentioned a few days ago was how um, the younger generation struggles with reality the way that the older generation struggled with technology. Obviously, when we use generation terms mm -hmm. on this podcast, it's pretty broad brush. Yep. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I think that, you know, the older generation, you say baby boomers, even some, even Gen X. My wife is one of these Gen X you know, people who I'm like, dear, were you? born in like the 1900s like you know the early 1900s like her trying to work like an apple tv is like you think she's launching like a <laughs> like she's this like, is so she's, funny though yeah, because she's driving a sub like a nuclear <laughs> sub or something i'm like <laughs> no yeah, uh, one of your daughters texted me last night i was like do you have the amazon password i'm like no i don't have the amazon i don't use your amazon Dude, i was like did you ask your mom and she goes my mom would not have the de amazon de password definitely would not so i think why there's a real struggle is because like with the older generation it was like there's gonna have to be people don't like change they don't like losing they get comfortable we like routine so you have a routine of okay you finally learn how to work a radio right now it's like it's a tv or now oh my god you learn how to work a, a cell phone now it's a smartphone and all those things we don't like to change routine i think that's the same thing that's happening with the younger generation because a lot has happened where you've lived in a even though you've gone through a recession and there's been wars and things like that but the market for the most part because of how we've pumped the market up has been up and to the right it's been where you've been able to kind of get what you know man like if i wanted something i could get it you know it wasn't like a lot of straw it wasn't struggle the way that i mean instant access with our phones amazon you know netflix whatever now i think things are going to be a little bit harder and I think that what you can end up doing is like just living in a fantasy world when you've had nothing like resistance. And so I think that what the generation that's kind of entering the workforce now, they're, they're realizing, man, there's like resistance. There's resistance to, man, you know, $100,000 ain't $100,000 and no more. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, it's like, it's man, not. it's not. And so, uh, you know, if you would have got that, everybody's like, oh, my God, if I make $100,000 and now people are like, you know, it's like I read something the other day where it's like, I think, I don't know where it was as a city. I mean, decent sized city, nothing big. It's like, but man, for a couple to actually live like just a, a actual, like kind of semi middle class comfort life, it's like $150,000, like in their home. And it's like, man, that's crazy. That was like rich, rich growing mm -hmm. up. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I think that's what they're facing. And I think that's going to be hard. And what you'll do is, you'll just live in more disconnected worlds. You'll just kind of live in a fantasy because living in reality makes you have to feel the pain of what's in front of you. Hmm. I like that you brought up the concept of, of change because essentially all New Year's goals, aspirations are, are, are people trying to have a vision for their life and yep. implement change um, to kind of match that vision. Why do you think that it is so hard to generate change in people and also keep the momentum? Well, I think it goes back to, I don't, I think the fuel behind it. I think if it's not a, uh, I personally believe it's not a fuel that's just beyond self um, that can actually help others eventually, even if it's a thing that's going to help you. But eventually that would help maybe your spouse or help a coworker or help your community. I think it stays hard because like, I think that fuel, I, I think we're built to, we're built to think about bigger things, bigger than just ourselves. And so I think a lot of times it gets lost because I don't think there's a real vision for why you're trying to do that. Um, and I think people, and so I think when you don't have a vision greater than just, okay, I'm just trying to do this thing. I'm just trying to get a promotion. Okay, well, why? Like, what is that about? Because then when you face resistance, 
then you, you know, because you're going to face resistance because you're bringing change. Change, in, when you're trying to bring change, there's going to be resistance. And if you don't have anything greater in front of you that's pushing you, you know, think about when you were, you know, you were cheering and you guys are trying to win a national championship, like the level of like conditioning and hard stuff and punishment and all the discipline you had to go through, it was because it was something greater. Like it would have been whole, like you wouldn't have gone through that if it's like, oh, I get to cheer at the football game. Like, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you, no. wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't have suffered for that. It was something greater, something that was something that was really, you were passionate about. And I think that's the issue. We don't have a greater vision with our goals that tie into a greater vision for our lives. So if you do, none of those connect, then you just will end up losing momentum because you're going to face that type of resistance. Mm. So I kind of want to keep hitting on the idea of change because essentially as a, as a firm at New Rules mm. Agency, what we do in corporate terms is change <laughs> management, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which is basically um, – within cultures we have to help people know where they're going and Mm -hmm. actually change their behavior in order to make sure um that that they are doing the things that they say that they want to do and they're being who they who they say that they are essentially Mm -hmm. so can you walk me through as someone who who does this every day especially Mm -hmm. when you're working with a client or a ceo how do you help them see a a greater vision Mm -hmm. because some sometimes people need help doing that it's not as simple as just like thinking about it and like you said there's resistance and some people don't always have the ability to like see a clear vision yep. for their life like mm-hmm. inner dialogue can get super complex and and crazy mm-hmm. um can you walk us through a little bit about how you help clients do that yeah i think one of the things is always i i start them because why we work directly with like you know kind of uh c suite is because they're leading the organization. And I believe that that is where the culture flows from. You know, I think any change you wanna have starts from the top. And so what I normally have to start with is getting um, people to actually tap in to who they actually are, become more self-aware. Because um, as you become more self-aware, you begin to actually look at your life. You begin to look at man patterns you begin to find things at one point you were really passionate about you begin to to see the impact you've had in certain areas a lot of times we don't actually evaluate our lives to where we've actually had impact and then what you so that starts there because sometimes when you start to look at your life you know it's that the quote i always say from parker j palmer your life is speaking to you you know it's just when you actually listen to it and i think many times when you let your life speak to you what you're able to do is then it's speaking to not only just the now, but it's speaking to your future. And so I think that's what why you have to start there. So I, I really get them to start with unlocking kind of authenticity, who they are. Like, and so a lot of times it's knowing their story. It's, it's what are sovereign themes in their life? You know, we've talked about that. That means what are places you find yourself when you're not wanting to find yourself? You just like, you're always like, you know, you're productive and leading or you're productive in, and kind of, you're always somebody who's in a place of change and you're always like being a disruptor or whatever. And so then you start to help them start to figure that out more. And then you start kind of helping them then map out. What does this look like for you? What would like 30, 40, years look like what would you be satisfied with what do you feel like your skill set skill set can lead you to why do you want to do that and as they work through that they start having a grander vision and then you can start working them down and backwards and what they've come to realize in in organizations is that as we help people do that because it can seem selfish because as a ceo you're helping them figure out man they're the ceo why do they need help you know figuring out who they are and and having vision and you know and and goals for their own personal life they need to be thinking about the company What I've realized is that as they get clear, they help the company get clear, which ultimately has an impact. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what we, you know, you kind of start, you got to help people again. It always comes back to you got to help people like become self-aware and kind of do the deep work within. How much do you need to have a really good understanding of, you know, the Simon Sinek start with why the infinite game, like Mm -hmm. an an understanding of of the long-term goal and purpose for your life Mm -hmm. in order to create like more finite, goals goals that build towards that yeah it's really important because i think once you you may not have like this direct target but i think if you have the fuel to know why so for me i've said it you know multiple times man it's this idea of unlocking authenticity so 
that allows me then to look at circumstances and say, man, where can I in the next six months really do that in a greater measure? Or what am I missing that can help me be better at that? Where do I, you know, at 45 right now, I'm starting to realize, man, how do I hone in even more on this? So now I'm thinking about, okay, where do I need to develop? What do I need to learn? Um, where do I need to do uh, deeper thinking? Where do I need to write more? Where do I need to put more content out? Like thinking about our podcast, like, man, what, what does this look like over the next six months of the content we are doing? All of that is all a part of that greater why. So I do think finding that why is really important because um, I think that can kind of push you forward in that process. I believe on this podcast we've talked about a scarcity mindset versus mm -hmm. an, an abundance mindset before. How much do you think having a scarcity mindset can impact the way that you shape your your goals? A lot because if you think the world has limited resources, um, and what I mean by that, if like if you think there's not going to be enough for you um, in what you're trying to do, if you don't feel like you have enough within you, what you then will do is you will sometimes your goals will be a lot less because you're thinking, well. I'm not going to be able to really achieve this. I'm not going to be able to really achieve that. Um, that's too grand of an idea. Um, the other thing what you'll start to do is you'll start to look at what other people are doing and you start to compete against other people. You start to like look at what lane they're in, what they're doing, what they're going after and start like copying what other people are doing because what you in, because you, you don't realize there's a man, I don't have a vision for myself. So I'm gonna go copy somebody else's vision realizing, no, there's a vision for you. You just gotta actually do it. The world's abundant. Like there's enough vision, there's vision for everybody. And there's something that I believe that it was placed inside of every human being to actually do. So I actually believe a scarcity mindsets can hinder people a ton because I think what they'll end up doing so much is not thinking outside the box, only thinking for what's in front of them. Um, and, and then what that leads to is then, you know, you kind of, you're not inspired. You know, I think a scarcity mindset, like it doesn't inspire you. It doesn't, you know I mean? Like you think about there's grand vision. It's the reason why a bunch of people go work for Elon. They know he's crazy. And what I mean by that, like they know that Elon like is, and I say crazy, like how his work ethic is. They know that, man, like this dude's going to, you know, he'll go on one of those things, those um, blitzes that they talk about, and then they're going to work like three weeks at 20 hours, something crazy. But people still go work for him. Because at the end of the day, he he knows who he is and he says that. Yeah. And here's, and you know what he does? That big abundant mindset he has inspires people. And, and I think that is something to learn from. Now, again, I don't, I'm not, I don't agree with, uh, I mean, everything that Elon does. I don't think I'm not one of those, you know, like tech bros that are like, you know, he's like a God, but like, <laughs> but I actually think there's, there's inspiration when you actually can, when you live and you think from a place of abundance, you know, and a place of abundance many times is even looking at the resources you have and realizing those resources are enough. You know, I had, a, I was meeting with somebody today. He's a, a he's a college athlete. Um, and you know, he's a really, really good basketball player. And the one thing I've been helping him process is that he has enough, like he's, he has enough who he is, is enough. Cause he's constantly, you know, he has some weak, like some deficiencies in certain areas, but in those deficiencies, but he's, he was always looking at the deficiencies. But then I was like, look, but as I stopped him, I was like, but no, let's look at these things though. Like, it, like that you have that like are just God given. And he'll spend so much time on his deficiencies, not looking at what he actually does well. I'm like, no, you have enough, you know, and he's actually started to buy and he started to play really well. And he, one thing he said to me today as we were meeting, he was like, man, he's like, I just have kept hearing what you've been saying. It's like, man, I have all that I need to be successful. And so I think that that, you know, those thinking what you have in your hand, that you have enough. That, so that, that is an abundance mindset. Mm -hmm. What it. What are some fears that you think kind of plague our society, culture as a whole, that drives a lot of our thinking and our decision making that most of us probably don't even realize is there? Yeah, I, I think that there are a lot of things that drive us um, that are like underneath. Like, I think one, I think one thing that does drive us is this idea of like 
and I say it over and over and it feels like I'm just this like weird dude that just like wants to talk about like suffering and pain, <laughs> but it's really not. I just think that it's what needs to be said. I think we don't, we're very fearful of like, of resistance. And when I say suffering and pain, I'm not just talking like, oh my God, something bad, like, you know, oh my God, uh, uh, like a, a, a illness or car crash or something that's like that. I'm just saying any type of resistance, any type of like, man, like a process of, oh man, I'm working and man, it may take you 10 years to get to a certain level. Um, man, it may take me, uh, instead of, you know, getting through this program in a year, it may take me three years. Um, you know, any type of thing that can cause resistance that gives us fear. So what we will do is sometimes we won't set goals and aspirations out there that we know when I set them, it's going to put it. There's going to be resistance from the beginning. Um, it has to seem like a lot of times it's smooth sailing kind of like at the best possible way. And, and I think we have a big fear of that. And I think sometimes that allows people to limit their impact, limit their growth because they're not willing to put themselves in situations that can actually, where there's going to be resistance, there's going to be some level of pain and challenge that's going to be there. I think another thing is that we today, because I think we are very anxiety driven, I think what can hinder us is very black and white thinking a lot to where we don't see a lot of the gray. We just think that it's okay. It's either this way or that way. And so when you were anxiety driven, it, it limits your options and it limits your ability to look at something else. You're like, oh, what if it was this way? But when it's just black and white, you know, it's like and, and because, you know, we've talked about this anxiety drops that black and white thinking and we live in a very anxious culture right now that that can limit us. That's another thick fear or hindrance in our culture. Being in a very anxiety filled culture can limit choices, options, creativity um, that's there. I also think, too, like I said, I think what you were saying earlier about scarcity mindset, because I think what that limits is collaboration, um, you know, that, man, there's enough, you know, sometimes you need somebody else. Uh, sometimes you need four or five people and everybody and there's enough for everybody. Um, and so I think that can limit collaboration. I think another thing is our fear of how we are perceived. I think that sometimes people won't put themselves put themselves out there in a goal or a challenge or something they're doing for the fear of how it'll look. Um, I used to have to do this a lot with the players when I did basketball skill training. I would really limit who was in the gym when I was working with somebody who was really trying to overcome a hurdle. Um, because when there's a lot of when there's people in the gym or cameras in the gym, they're not going to take risk. They were, they were, they were afraid to fail. Um, man, what if that got put out there? What if, you know, if I'm working with a guy who's getting back in shape and coming back from an injury and people see him and they known him to be super athletic and in great shape. And then they see him kind of struggling as he's like in this process of rehab then they won't go all out because they'll be limited. You know, they'll, they'll kind of halfway do it. And so we're not getting the most out of the workouts because I think we have a big fear of image. And so I think that can hinder kind of some people's actual like growth. And those are things that are within culture. I think hinders us from actually setting those proper healthy, even those goals that are like, you know, that can really stretch us to get us to where we need to go personally. Mm, I like what you said about that. I think that Something that I heard a while back, I don't even remember where I, I heard it, but I think about it all the time, is just to, n to not be afraid to be seen trying. Mm. And I have to tell myself that all the time, yeah. because most of the time, it's the fear of people's perception of, of how I do something yep. when I'm trying to solve a problem mm. over the the fear of, of solving the problem in itself. Absolutely. And I'm definitely reminded of that um, as you're talking. No, that's a great point. And, and I think that it's okay. Like, I think we've got to, I think if you're out there and you're leading people, I think you have to help failure is a part. Um, and you got to give people the room to do that. You also have to um, help them understand that there's like, there are like consequences with failure and that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to go. And if you fail, there may be some consequences. That's okay. Um, but I think you gotta be able to create like healthy. Cause I think sometimes where it can get unhealthy is when people are like, Oh, you know, I'm just where they can create a culture of like failure 
where where they'll say like, man, you know, fail fast, fail often, um, you know, don't have a fear of failure. But what they don't do with that is give them a healthy understanding of that, of where I think you should give people the ability in the room to fail, but also what comes with that, because what that does is that then their wins and their victories or even in their failure, what they'll do is the consequence of that failure. They won't accept that they'll pass that to you. So it's like, well, you should just, well, you know, I mean, we should be able to fail here. And you're like, no, you should. But then also know that, man, we may lose a client. Okay. And I'm okay with that. But don't like just, you know, like shrug that off. Don't try to like when you fail, then don't do the autopsy. What could you have done better? Mm -hmm. So I think those two tensions actually have to be there. And I think that should. Or not ask for help. Yeah. That's a a great, that's a great one. Yeah. Not ask for help. You're just like, okay, well, I I just got to do this and fail. You're like, no, there may be somebody sitting right (laughs) next to you who actually didn't fail. And they actually know the one thing, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's like in the words of Jay-Z, I'm trying to give you a million dollar games for nine ninety nine. Like, just <laughs> they already got the million dollar lesson. Don't, and they're trying to give it to you for cheap. Don't go out there and try to learn a lesson. That's one of my, that's one of my acts or things I say a lot. It's like, don't pay a heavy price for something that somebody already did that you can get for free. There are going to be enough things you have to pay a heavy price for that you're going to have to just learn to experience. But if I don't have to learn that, if I'm walking with somebody who's already learned that lesson and I can learn from that without doing that, man, why not? Because you're going to have enough. I think we live in this world of where people are so constantly trying to, you know, we'll, like those who are older will say, man, like, you know, the experience or, or those who are younger, I would say this, like, man, no, I just got to, you know, I got to go do this on my own. I got to go fail. I got to go, you know, I got to go experience these things. And I'm like. Trust me, life will bring you enough. You don't have to go searching for opportunities to like deal with that. Like that'll come. Just just live enough. Mm-hmm. But when you actually can learn something quick, or you can like, oh, somebody went through this, somebody did this, and I can quickly learn from that. Man, do that because you know what? That's going to help move something forward, maybe faster. That's going to help you not have to learn. You know, why, why learn a lesson? You know what I'm saying? It's like if I watch somebody burn their hand on a stove, I don't have to touch that stove to know, like, oh, it's hot. I just saw them do that. I'm good. I don't ever have to do that. Like I, I tell people a lot growing up, there was things I stayed out of trouble, and I'm super thankful for it because you know what? I watch people who are older do those things, and I'm like, I saw that. I don't want that consequence, mm-hmm. and I didn't have to go do it. I I knew I learned enough. It was seared in my brain, their impact, their consequence for that. And so I always just kind of been somebody where I'm like, yeah, let me just learn from somebody else's experience. So anyway, that was a little bit of a (laughs) thing. No, it's helpful. Um, You've mentioned fear quite a few times. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we kind of talked about already this week and and related to your son, Jalen. A few days ago, whenever we were on Thanksgiving break, I was watching the movie Divergent. Mm -hmm. And some of it is that there are these people who think differently. They're labeled as divergent yeah. because they think out of the box and they can't be put in a box. Um, the, they're trying to essentially you know, annihilate them. And uh, whenever they put someone who's divergent in this like fear simulator to see what they will do, mm. um, they, whenever the, this girl goes through, through the simulator and she wakes up, the person is like, you didn't basically like you didn't tell me you were divergent and she's mm. kind of like how did you know and yeah. he was like well um whenever we put people who aren't through a simulator um fear essentially it, it stops them in their tracks like mm. fear f- makes them freeze yep. but fear wakes you up mm. what do you think um what do you think makes somebody respond to fear that way where it actually awakens them rather than makes them freeze in their tracks um, I, I think a couple of things. I think one, I think there is, I think that's something that you have to, well, let me say this. I think there may be some people who actually naturally just kind of, when they face fear, they kind of just mount whatever I'm just running through it. You know, some of it could be, they're just like unaware. You know what I'm saying? Those same people don't have fear. You're like, no dog, you should fear. There's some dudes out there with baseball bats. You're like, nah, I'm not going to go out there, you know? But I also think a lot of it is just like, it's, you have to unlearn. I think fear naturally does make us freeze or run away. And actually, I think it's learning the behavior. I think it's how somebody does. I think they have to learn that. I think they have to be willing in those moments um, 
to when they've walked away or when they've been frozen to try to assess how was I feeling in that moment? What was happening in that moment? What what about that really made me fearful? And it's interesting you bring this up and it's interesting, you know, because you've helped me with that um, with kind of the mantra this year for Jalen, um, you know, going to the senior year. Um, and one of the things is that as I was even thinking about it yesterday was it's kind of where I've been over the past like year um, where I started to realize even at my age to where man, how fear can really grip me. You know, the fear of death can really like grip me Um, the fear of the future and like kind of what it causes inside of my body. And that has been one of the things that I feel like that God has actually been like working out of me because I've been in some situations this year where I'm like, oh, this could be like a, a potential thing. And and what and it was just it was making me so like, I mean, just like honestly, like just scared and like and just I mean, where the where my brain would go to, you know, where a moment would happen or I would hear something. And it's like I went to the worst possible outcome scenario. And I realize that part of that is just learning to how do you actually manage that? And that's what I've been learning. So actually how you do it, I think you have to manage that anxiety. One of the things I've realized is like, okay, what's in front of me? Why is this fearful? You know what I mean? It's kind of like looking at it being like, okay, is it that? Looking at the history, have I dealt with that? Has it been something that's, you know, has it gone to this terrible conclusion? And a lot of times there's like most of them, no. And so now I have to like tell myself that. You know, you have to be able to sit there in moments and talk to yourself like, no, this is where it's at. But that's such a skill. It is. No, it really is. I feel like when we talk about it, um, and this isn't, you know, related to how you're explaining it as much as like there is like, it's so hard to put to words the experience and what it feels like to be like afraid of something and genuinely think that outcome is going to happen and have the mental discipline to talk to yourself yes. like in that moment to the point where it changes your emotional and like physical reaction and like mm. choices from that circumstance. Yeah. Cause even as you're talking right now, it's like making me think about like, even cause I felt like, you know, I, I've been, you know, we've talked a lot about just kind of going through the somatic therapy and just kind of like learning, like when my body, I see the times you can feel it and speak. And I, and it's funny because as I'm even saying this, there were a couple scenarios, there were a couple situations, and here's what's crazy: they're not even anything that I should be remotely fearful of, or have anxiety about. But because I mean, as I'm, you're talking, I'm like, I, I like literally saying, I'm like, oh, I feel some type of way today, and I was like, what is it? And like, as you're like, I'm mean, listening to you talking to me, I'm hearing everything you're saying, but then in my brain, I'm like, oh, what was it today? And here's something as simple. It's the fact of like, I didn't check this today. It's like, you know, I do a lot of like, like, you know, speaking prep. Well, if I'm speaking in front of, you know, clients or, you know, with pastoring a church, you know, again, I'm speaking probably 35, 38 times a year on Sundays, multiple services. Well, I've done this for a while and I've been working on like today, like this Tuesday's usually my day we record this. I'm usually doing writing or, you know, kind of like preparing and all that. And I had this overwhelming, about like a sermon I have to do like this upcoming week. And I'm like, I've done this so much. Mm-hmm. I do. I think I do a pretty decent job at it. And I'm like, and I feel happy. I'm like, why am I like freaked out? I'm not going to be able to figure out what I'm going to say and do that. And it's like, but I don't check that. And then it becomes a little thing. And it's another thing. It's another thing. And it becomes a small little things of fear or mm-hmm. that drives you to then they turn into a big thing. And so going back to it, I, yeah, you have to really become really present and aware when you're feeling fear and really talk to yourself and really walk yourself down saying, God, there are certain things you're like, no, this is a serious thing. Like, you know, all of a sudden, man, you know, you start to fearful that like, you know, I started to, you know, maybe you start to find a hand tremor or something and you're like, uh, all right, I don't want to go to the doctor, you know, cause man, what if it's like this? Like, no, those fears. Okay. That's a, that's a decent thing to fear from. Okay. Well, until you get new information, you know, you don't want to keep running laps around the track until you get new information. So, okay, this is what I have right now. And I'll go to the doctor. But sometimes that fear should lead you. It should wake you up to like, oh, man, maybe I need to go get this checked out. Because maybe if I get this checked out, it may be something that is serious, but I got to it early versus kind of waiting because I had a lot more fear around it or whatever. And so, I don't know. I think it really is a skill. But I think we are way more fear driven than I think we actually really recognize in our culture, mm-hmm. like way more. 
would you say that sums up um the anxiousness Mm -hmm. and the depression yeah because i think it's really you know it is that fear of the future it's the fear of what's coming what's next it's the it's the what ifs it's all those things and when you're living in an uncertain world right now it's high i mean we're living you know as of you know as we're recording we're you know of uh a war in the middle east that like two or three things go a certain way like you're in world war three you know, and on top of that, Russia, Ukraine, they're still there. On top of that, there are, you know, I mean, when you start looking there, um, because of like climate issues, there's more, there are droughts and some of the impact it's going to have on, you know, food, you know, food scarcity is going to happen among people and starvation is, you know, that's one of the things that they're talking a lot about starvation and it's, it's wild stuff and it's very uncertain times. You know, we got here in our country, man, we got political elections coming up this year that everybody is already like, oh my God. Like, you know, fearful of that. I mean, we saw what happened in 2020, 2016. Now we're like, all right, here we go. 2024, two people that nobody really wants to vote for are probably going to be the ones running and what that's going to create in our country. And and so I think all that's just underneath there. And I think it's just, it's just driving a lot of what's happening. This question is not related all to right, cool, <laughs> but, but I want to ask you about it. It is related to what you're talking about right now. Um, but don't you think that we... Uh, as humans in a sick t- twisted way kind of like the drama oh yeah we do we like chaos we really like chaos um <laughs> so you said i am the drama, I <laughs> am the dr- we, we, are the drama. we are we no, are the drama no but i was thinking drama. about it because we watched you know the new hunger games series yep. recently mm-hmm. and as i'm watching this movie about people watching people fight yep to the death yep. you know not always by choice there's almost this like parallel still to society today mm-hmm. and how like as i'm watching it i don't necessarily feel like that is that far off there's like a oh i could see a world in which like yeah we want to watch people like do those things or mm. or can can view those things a little bit more consistently because because I can watch this happening on my TV even though it's acting yep. I can watch this happening mm-hmm. on my TV but, you know barely flinching yep. and on top of that in the real world the level of access we have to mm-hmm. like war and yep. and all this stuff that that over time you come a little become a little bit like numb to mm. what it is that you're actually seeing yep. and you kind of become interested and intrigued in all of the dynamics that do or don't cause those things from happening like politics Mm -hmm. no i i i don't we're not too far from that i mean you know we see it and again i'm i'm totally fine with boxing mma whatever you know but we're we watch people like you know that happen i mean we you know I think the more and more the moral fabric of our country, and what I mean by that, I'm not talking of the moral fabric. A lot of times people use that, and it's usually used by politicians, you know, that will try to, like, whatever side, whatever they deem to be moral, they lift that up, right? Um, I'm talking about actually, like, just tried and true things that make that are the right things, that make, a you know, a country or make a world flourish. That's why, you know why I believe, you know, in the Bible, because I actually believe that the way that actually, you know, that God calls humanity to live and to care and to serve and to build around, I actually think it works, you know? Um, I mean, people have their issues with America. America has all the stuff. I'm not saying this is not a Christian nation. A nation can be Christian. A person can. I do think there's principles that were founded. I think that has made this like no one's ever done this experiment. I know people right now are not high on America. And again, that we have our we have our flaws of our past, hundred percent, but like no one's done this experiment of where you bring people from all over to one place. And and I think the more the moral fabric disappears, the more you're going to see, you know, yeah, that it wouldn't shock me that you're I mean we aren't too far off of people watching that. I mean, listen, like I was, I'm, I was reading a book and, um, and this book was talking about the idea of building, how do you really build diverse worlds? 
And the story was talking about like how it was a, you know, it was a, a, a guy was like kind of telling you where there was someone it was like in the 1900s and they were like, man, this good Christian family had people over for like Bible study, man would cook for their neighbors, man, when someone was sick, they would do all these things. And, um, you know, they would take care of them. They would have their kids over, man. They went to church every Sunday. They gave money to the church. They volunteered around their neighbors, all this stuff. And then in the same breath, he says, but the same family were like, man, let's do something together as a family with other people in the community. And they were going to watch a lynching. And you're just like, dude, that's not like my grandfather passed away five years ago, six years ago. My grandfather saw people when he would drive when he would drive back from Mississippi with his dad, people hanging on trees. Like he just died five I believe it was like five years ago. Yeah. So I'm like, Yeah, we're not that far removed. I think so many times we think, Oh, we would never do that. I'm like, Really? Like, we're not that far removed from seeing this. I mean yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just a, it's a, it's a definitely a it's different. Eerie. It's very, it's very, very eerie, and I think that, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of things that will continue to move down these roads. But I always say this: that in those moments when there's something like that going on, there's always there's always something being built in the background that could be greater. And so that's where my hope is at. You know, I mean, like I've always told you, like I my hope is so much in the generation and yours. No, I really do. I really believe, but I also believe that um, that's why we do this podcast. That's why I, I help develop, you know, next generation leaders, because I believe it's going to prepare them for a world they're going to enter, you know, that I don't think they're prepared for. And it's not going to be like the, oh man, up on the mountaintop type stuff. It's going to be, oh no, it's the, it's going to be grimy. But will they have resilience? Mm -hmm. Will they be self-aware? Will they have toughness? That's why I talk about this so much because that's what's coming. You're going to have to have that in order to be someone who still can make an impact during this generation. Hmm. Well, I do want to ask you, Hmm. uh, this is a (laughs) sharp turn. I know, sharp turn. This is how we live our lives. Like, this is what we do. (laughs) This is is second nature to us. Yeah, this is what Brie gets used to that. You're like, hey, man, what are we going to eat for dinner? Then it's like, man, Israel Hamas. Like, what do we think about that? You're like, it just goes so dark. And then it's like 30 minutes later, okay, good night. Yeah, good night. See you (laughs) later. See you in the morning. See you in the morning. Have a good day. Like, yeah, 100%. Um, Can you share a little bit about, I guess, some practicals on how you typically do your yeah. annual goals? Do mm. you do you operate off of themes? I do. I, I've never been a very like, hey, here is the, you know, um, for me, um, they, are, I do, they need to be measured for sure. Um, but I kind of go in themes. So for me, I heard something by Jim Collins. Jim Collins was a... Uh, writer of good to great great um again he you know um, i thought that book was like was really revolutionary um also but he does a ton of consulting and one of the things that jim collins does and i heard him on a podcast talk about this he doesn't do a ton of like kind of interviews and podcasts so whenever you can hear one it's pretty cool it's on tim ferris i believe and he said something and it stuck with me he says i try to do a thousand creative hours a year and man he and he talked about why and when he said that, it just resonated with me. And so for me, I've done this now. This is year three. And again, I'm not saying this is the only reason, but three of, I think, the most impactful, um, you know, seeing not only the the different things that I lead really grow. And I think because I've had more room to be creative. I would agree with that. Yeah. For sure. I think creativity is a huge part for what I do. And when I think about creativity, it's not just, oh, I was thinking of abstract. It's actually working on things that are not like okay i've got a you know like man okay here's this client like you know proposal that's not like that's not a creative hour creative hours are man when i have to speak that's i create so that's creative hours when i'm thinking about how when i'm actually going to work with the client i mean how we're going to approach the work with this organization and how we're going to kind of man deliver this work and what are we going to you know what is our uh, off site's going to look like that's creative for me um, when I'm thinking about a new kind of like, if I'm thinking about, man, maybe a new entity or something like that, that's create. Those are all creative hours, sometimes reading because those, if I'm going to read a certain book, that's creative hours for me because of what, what I know it sparks in me to then go and do. And so that's been a huge thing for me, um, because I find life 
there. Like I think so many times that I was I was really getting stifled because I was just so much in the leadership role of like the day to day execution kind of functioning that way. And what I've realized is that what it's forced me to do, it's forced me to get out of some of the day to day stuff because I've got to get to this um, and make me empower other people. Um, so I can, so that's one, that's one like a goal I have. And so that, that's a bigger theme. It's not very specific of like, you know, I have to have a thousand, you know, creative hours on, you know, a new business. No, it's just like, it's a every thousand. week from yeah. nine to 10. That's it. I have to yeah. and so research X, Y, Z. And so I have to track it and it matters to me. And so I, I do a monthly, no quarterly. It's like a quarterly review, um, on that. So I'll like every, pretty much every night, my assistant, um, will actually text me. Um, there's a few things I'm tracking and like she'll text me every night and I'll send it back to her and then she just records it throughout the week and then we just kind of do a review. And so I've been doing that and, um, yeah, so that's one. So I would say I do themes, but what I would say, no matter what, and again, you can, there's so many things you could go follow so many podcasts you can listen to about like how to do that's going to be way better than what we probably would say to you as far as like tracking goals and things like that. What I think others won't say that's the most important part is again, getting back to why, what is this tying to? Like, what is it tying to? Is this helping tie to anything that's beyond you? Is it helping tie to a greater part of who you're called to be? Um, is this tying to, um, you know, do you have, what's the fuel underneath it? Do you see like long term where this is kind of going to head? So I, I, I want to get to the why, because I think the why is what will get you to not get stuck. You know, like, so sometimes people are like, oh man, I'm going to start working out. Well, why? And you got to find what's that motivation. Maybe for you, man, to look better because it's going to make you, man, when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm going to, I'll feel better about myself, which in turn will make me, I know that how I respond and act to other people will be better. Mm-hmm. Man, go do that. That's, that's a great why. It's not, I'm not saying like, that shouldn't be like, you know, because I know like usually fitness goals are something people try to do. Go do that. If you want to look better, there's nothing wrong. But is the why just only to look better for the sake of looking better? Then I think what's going to happen, that's why you get to February or March and, you know, you're no longer going to the gym. And I think that's what's really important. I also think, too, be realistic in that. Um, why don't be a psycho? And like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh man, I haven't worked out. And then it's like, you know, I'm going seven days a week. I'm like, all right, <laughs> no, that's not going to gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but my point is like, why, why do you want to go seven days a week? Like, what are you proving? What are you, is it, is it longevity? Like, what are you now? If it's, if you're like, man, I'm just trying to build toughness. Maybe you feel like, man, I need to build toughness. So you're like, I'm just going to every day do something incredibly difficult because I need to train. So every day I want to do this or five days a week, I'm going to do something that really is tough and challenging. Man, okay, that's a good why, but make sure you know the why, not just out of this like anxiety driven thing of like, well, I've got to do this because I'm trying. Because most time we have those crazy goals, it's because we just want to get it over with. Like, all right, I wanna, man, right, I'm gonna work seven days a week because you know I'm trying to lose forty pounds. So I'm gonna lose forty pounds seven. Days, I'm gonna do it in two months. You're like, great, okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, it's a lot easier. It's like Ozempic right now. You know what I'm saying? Give <laughs> the shot. Like that's like that's way easier than actually going out there right now and like you know. We'll uh, so we'll put a link in the <laughs> yeah. You know, looking to show notes. You know what I'm saying? Pfizer, give your boy. You know, give us a little, give us a little sponsorship on the pod. So no, that's it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I do have one more question. Okay. Um, from the people. From the people. What is an element of your faith that is challenging to communicate with those who do not share the same faith as you? And I, what I love about this mm. question is that you cons- are consistently communicating concepts regarding your faith yep. all the time. So yep. I would love to know what is the most challenging topic to communicate. Hmm. I think when, right now, one of the most challenging topics is how can I have like a traditional, what we would quote unquote call evangelical view of marriage, but actually still have a deep love and care and respect uh, for people who don't hold that view because of the anxiety driven world we live in today people's anxiety because we may have a disagreement would think that like naturally oh you hate this person you're against this person and that's not the case 
just as I don't think somebody who doesn't hold my view is against me. Um, we just have different views. And this is what I believe that my faith teaches me. And in that actual, real, genuine faith should lead to man, even greater love, care, compassion, and love, care, and compassion does not mean agreement. Love, care, and compassion means that I am man, that I am understanding, but also that for that, I don't look at you in a way that you're less than me because you don't hold my same view. When I talk to you, I'm not here trying to convince you of those things. This is just my view. And you ask me and I'll tell you. And so I think that's really hard today, you know, whether it's on that or on the issues of, 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 trans, of trans and stuff like that. Um, I think that's a hard thing. And it's and, and what I have to walk people through and in that when they do talk to me about it is have to help unravel like kind of their anxiety sometimes. And I have to say a lot like my words are my words and your anxiety can't read into what you think my intentions are. Um, my words are my words and my actions will be my actions, you know, cause I, I'll tell people, have I treated you any different? Have I like started to like, you know, have I said things that are like hateful towards you? Have I, um, told other people I cannot, you know, have I like, you know, gossiped around your back around this and they'll be like, no, no, no. I'm like, so now it's your anxiety reading to my intentions, not trusting the spoken word. So I have to touch this is a lot of work. And honestly, a lot of times people don't want to do that because what they, it's just easier to just put you in a box. And so I think that's, what's hard, but, um, but still today, you know, I'm like, somebody asked me, they're like, man, how can you have this traditional view? But man, like, but you are like, but in corporation organizations, like you are like, you know, you're pushing and you are for people from all different types of, you know, again, um, from different backgrounds, races, genders, you're like pushing them, sexuality, whatever, you're pushing them to maybe be like to move up an organization. I'm like, because that, if they're good at their job, they're good at their job. You know what I'm saying? And I think people can't do they, they So even on the other side of it, what happens, people who are Christian ridicule me because they're like, you're not taking a strong enough stance. And I'm like, you're a freaking idiot. Like it has nothing to, like it pisses me off because I'm like, like I can separate things like, you know what I'm saying? Like my view of what I may think of somebody in marriage or something, or what I believe is like, you know, what I believe is God's design for marriage. But then somebody doesn't hold that view. That doesn't mean can they do I, when they work for a company? I'm like, do you do supply chain? Well, that has nothing to do with like, are you freaking good at your job? Are you a good leader? And you know what? I've learned a lot of people who have different views are, are you know, men, a lot of times they're really good leaders. And I really enjoy working with them. And so that's just kind of what I think is really hard. Um, but I think it's what actually being called to it. Um, and so I'm thankful. There's times where, I mean, yeah, I don't like it because I wish just like it was supposed to be way easier to just not say anything or go over here. Mm -hmm. But actually people are really shocked when they find out that I'm actually like, oh, my God, like you're, you're a pastor. You do this and you're doing this. It's because – my faith is the center of everything that I do. And I don't have to quote the Bible. I don't have to say Jesus said this. I don't have to come off a certain way because it's just who I am. And so I live this way. So I care for people. I stand firm on things. I am not perfect. I make mistakes. I apologize when I make a mistake. Um, yeah. And so I just, just what I feel called to. And so for some people, they like it for some people, they don't. And so at the end of the day, it's just what it is. And I, and I always tell people I won't at the end of my life, like I won't give an account to you for what I did with my life. I don't believe that. I don't believe I'll give an account to, you know, to the United States of America, you know, or Karen or, you know, woke girl 75 on Twitter. I'm not giving an account to you for my life. So whatever, like at the end, I'll give an, I believe I'll give an account to God for what I did with his life. And so that's what I kind of live for. And so, you know, I, every day I'm constantly asking, am I doing what you need me to do? So that's kind of where I'm at. You heard it here first folks. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have questions about anything, please just ask me, be a functioning adult and ask clarifying questions. That's the one thing I think we could get better at. If we all just become healthy adults and ask clarifying questions 
and go from there. You know, I've learned that. I've learned from people, man, where I've had views. And when I ask clarifying questions, I'm like, oh, man, that's, you know, like, it's really good. It's like, man, that's actually thoughtful. That's this. I don't have to agree, but it's a very thoughtful thing versus me just assuming that it wasn't a thought out thing. So I think that's the biggest thing. Ask clarifying questions. So until next time, keep writing new rules.